Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining our webinar today on uh, navigating the safe return to work. This is the second in the series of webinars that we've brought to you um, in helping to provide you with information and resources so that you and your uh, teams can uh, navigate the safe return to work. Today, we are going to talk about liability and safety protocols from a risk perspective in the workplace. Before we get into that, I'd like to ask all of you if you have any comments or questions, if you'd either put them in the question section or in the chat section, we will be sure to address those questions at the end of our session. In addition to that, for all of the participants that stay on, um, that are participating today, we have actually a complimentary snack box that you will be sent um, in appreciation for your participation as well as a means for you to see an opportunity for you to either connect with your uh, work from home employees or show uh, appreciation and gratitude for your teams during these tough times that everybody's been working through, uh, or as a nice way to acknowledge the holiday season. So we will be sending that to all of you. You will get the form and follow up at the end of this presentation for you to submit your information for us to send that to the address of your preference. My name is Lisa Demore, and I joined Corporate Essentials in 2017. And I uh, bring to you and to the organization a diversified understanding of employees and work environments from a real variety of industries. And the industries include tech, finance, communications, healthcare, hospitality, and education. With me today on our panel, we have Jeff and, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, I missed my little bio there. Uh, we have Jeff with us. Jeff, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? You're muted. No way. No, he's muted. He cannot hear. Bear with me a minute. No way. There he is. Okay. Can you hear me? Lisa, you're muted. Okay. Better. Thank you. Okay, Jeff. Okay. Good morning, Lisa, and welcome. Um, I'm Jeff Titel. I'm an insurance consultant. I've been in the business for over 30 years. Uh, to give you basic ideas to what we do, uh, let's start with what we don't do. We don't sell any insurance whatsoever. What we do is work for medium to large size corporations on their property and casualty insurance portfolio, reviewing and analyzing their risks, their exposures, and their insurance contracts. We help them with their loss control, loss prevention. And what we also do is provide for them a professional marketing effort by bringing in a multitude of different brokers reviewing and analyzing the quotes that are received, negotiating the terms and conditions, as well as the premium to ensure that our clients are receiving the most comprehensive insurance product at the most reasonable insurance premiums at the time. Thank you. And at the end of the presentation and follow up, you'll all receive all the contents from this presentation as well. And next, I'd like to introduce you to Michael. Michael, would you share a little bit about yourself with our guests? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. 
My name is Michael Sapper. I'm uh, an attorney in, uh, admitted to practice in New York and New Jersey. I'm in my uh, Roseland, New Jersey office this afternoon, um, but we also have a, a, an office in uh, Midtown Manhattan. I co-chair the, uh, the law firm's uh, business litigation practice. We're a full service law firm of about 95 lawyers um, in all different areas, uh, all different departments. You can see on your screen some of the things I've been involved with over my career, continue to be involved with. Um, in corporate essentials has been a client of mine for many, many years. Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity to meet everybody today. Thank you. And we thank both of you for participating as do our guests on the webinar today. And so let's get into it. Here's what we're going to uh, cover with all of you today. Today, we will talk about the areas of legal risk employers need to be most aware of related to COVID-19 uh, and having employees in the workplace, whether you've had some return uh, or you're in the process of returning various cohorts over time, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, risk transfers and uh, that you need to put in place or make sure in place with uh, the vendors that you're choosing to utilize for your personal protective equipment or other related safety items and sterilization items in the workplace during these times. Important policies and protocols a company should have in place to return to work. Uh, we'll talk about insurance coverage and which policies may, may is the key word there, provide coverage for COVID-19 related exposures and uh, touch upon the pros and cons requiring employees signatures on waivers and how often that those need to be signed and how COVID-19 has affected the overall insurance market and the effects that it will have on your company's upcoming insurance renewal. So let's get started. Okay, I'm going to ask um, on our legal team, Michael, if you would talk, to, uh, speak to this. What areas of legal risk do employers need to be most aware of related to COVID-19 and having employees in the workplace? All right, thank you, Lisa. So the the not so good news, I, I assume most people will recognize on the call, is that um, employment law has blown up over the last couple of decades. And uh, unfortunately, employers can see themselves as having a bullseye on their backs. So I don't say that to be funny. It's just literally a reality. So there are really three areas of uh, legal risk that employers need to concentrate on. And in no particular order, they involve a sick leave policy, an accommodation policy, and workplace safety policy. So just taking them in that order, uh, federal and state laws both impose an obligation on employers to have internal workplace policies. And an employer who fails to know and comply with federal and state sick leave laws can find themselves on the other end uh, of a complaint. Handbooks are crucial because ambiguous or confusing handbook policies could result in an employee claiming that the employer or the company has breached one or more provisions of the handbook. And there's a concern that employers should have about misapplying sick leave procedures because those often become, or they, they, they progress into discrimination claims. So the takeaway for a sick leave policy is to have it clearly defined. It should be in the employee manual in the handbook and should define employee benefits and compliance with the law. As far as accommodation policy is concerned, um, 
you can get guidance from looking up your local uh, state and federal agency guidelines. Um, but an employer has to keep in mind that an employee is not entitled to an accommodation if he or she says, I don't wanna wear a mask in the office um, or I have a medical condition that prevents me from coming to the office. The employee is not entitled to an accommodation if one, they can't perform their job functions with the accommodation. Two, the accommodation would unduly burden the employer. Or three, the accommodation would pose a health or safety risk to others in the workplace. So one of the things COVID has made a little easier from this standpoint is that there's some uniformity of safety. In other words, socially distancing, um, wearing a mask, those are common accommodations that uh, employers can easily make for the employees. And as far as workplace safety policies are concerned, you really got to kind of read the paper every day because executive orders are coming out of New Jersey and New York and in other states um, in light of the predicted second wave. If it's, if it's not here already, it's, it's, it's coming soon. So um, I can't be specific about that because it varies from state to state. I would just, I would just encourage everybody to have their uh, HR people or the owners of the company themselves remain conversant with what's been issued by their particular state. Yeah, Michael, you hit on some really important points there about not only having the policies, but ensuring that the employees throughout the workplace know what they are and uh, that it's communicated as well as the importance of staying up to it on a day-to-day -day basis. I can tell you that here at you know, Corporate Essentials, we are making sure that our team that supports our clients and any other uh, companies out there that would like our support or information, we've made it our business to make sure that we are staying on top of uh, what the requirements are, as well as the ability to provide those solutions that are needed in the workplace. So um, I know that you are also available, as is Jeff, to be trusted resources um, or resources available to our participants and our clients alike. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Jeff, uh, what risk transfers uh, should we have in place with a vendor when purchasing personal protective equipment, PPE, and other safety and sterility uh, items for our workplaces? That's a great question, Lisa. Um, the, work class is, the workplace has changed. The environment has changed. Uh, when did we have uniforms, yeah. including masks and gloves and providing cleaning equipment to the various clients? It's, it has changed completely. So what happens is we need to take a look. I think, first of all, we, what we should do is define what insurance is. Insurance is a transfer of risk, and that can be done a whole host of different ways. You can buy an insurance policy, you can transfer to third parties. So let's stay on the third parties for a second. What we suggest is to transfer the risk when you're buying some of the PPE equipment to the third party, to your vendor. And a lot of clients felt that the PPE equipment that they were going to distribute would be covered under their practice policy. And due to the nature of the changes in the environment, many of those policies would not respond. Corporate Essentials is a little bit brighter than the average bear. Judson decided <laughs> he was going to help his clients by providing some PPE equipment to them. Not only wanted to make sure that they were working in a safe environment, but also wanted to make sure that if God forbid there was an issue, his insurance was going to match to that. So he made some changes for that, which may possibly not be the case for all of the people that you deal with. So in order to properly protect yourself, what we strongly suggest is putting a signed executed contract in place with your vendor where there's a hold harmless and identification in your favor. That should be for all contracts that you have. 
but then to take it an additional step and to have them provide you with a certificate of insurance, naming you as an additional insured. Having you as a certificate holder is not going to hold water. What happens is it needs to dovetail with the contract that you've executed, and therefore you would then be able to have their policy protect and indemnify you. The next item, which is probably the most important in today's environment, is have them confirm that there are no COVID related exclusions in the policy for which they're providing the product. Okay, so it's really important that uh, we ensure that we are checking the policies of the companies that we are procuring these items from, as well as asking the relevant questions around it. Thank you. Sure. What are the most important policies, Michael, and protocols a company should have in place when they return to the workplace or as they return to the workplace, as we know, people are sort of returning in either, you know, a, a, a staggered, staggered return to work or in cohorts. Right. Well, there's a little bit of overlap from the first question because first and foremost, what's most important in terms of policies and protocols a company should have in place when employees are returning to the workplace is that defined and compliant uh, sick leave policy. I think um, we're already starting to see it. I think it's only going to intensify. There are going to be more and more lawsuits um, by employees against uh, employers regarding uh, non-compliance with either the handbooks uh, recitation of the sick leave policy or non-compliance with the law relating to sick leave policies. So again, I can't emphasize enough that having that clearly defined is, is absolutely crucial. Kind of related to that is the protection of health information relating to employees. What companies have to understand is that there has to be a process within the company for protecting health information that will be gathered in the course of receiving accommodation requests and daily health checks. For instance, there's a new executive order um, in New Jersey that required daily screenings. It was only effective, I believe, November 5th um, to comply with the Americans uh, Against Disability Act and the uh, New Jersey law against discrimination. The company has to understand how to legally inform employees that a coworker has tested positive or has symptoms without divulging that person's identity. So what's the challenge there? Well, there are a lot of challenges, but one major challenge is how do you recognize a person's right to privacy while not jeopardizing others in the workplace who had contact with that employee who either tested positive for the virus or who has symptoms. So Lisa, that's, that's kind of the tightrope. You obviously wanna put safety first of your employees and you need to undertake an internal investigation to ascertain to what extent did the infected or possibly infected employee have contact with others in the organization? If you have a small, you know, let's say five, six, under 10 uh, um, employee company, that's far different than if you have three, four, 500 employees under one roof. So, um, you have to be careful. I can't give you a playbook to tell you exactly what to do 
But what you want to do as an employer is after completing that investigation, indicate to any employees that might have come into contact with that infected person, advise them. If they ask you who it was, do not disclose who it was. Keep it general, but just make sure that you're giving the possibly infected employee or employees enough information so that he or she is aware of the risk and can address it accordingly. Uh, I guess the only other thing I'd, I'd add is with regard to health related policies or protocols, employers can consult OSHA or CDC guidance for return to work precautions. I would strongly encourage that so if there's any gray area, OSHA or the CDC can fill in those gaps. Great, thank you for those resources. And in a previous uh, webinar that we hosted, Rich Morrow did co uh, cover the OSHA resources and the links to that. Yes. If any of you on here need it today, feel free to reach out to Corporate Essentials and we can provide you a recording of that webinar as well. But you did hit on two key points here as well as the importance of the information you shared. And um, you'll hear me say this again and again throughout today's uh, webinar here that what's really important is how do we make our people, everyone feel more comfortable? And what makes people feel more comfortable is having these defined policies and protocols clearly spelled out and communicated throughout your um, workforce and through your workplace so that everyone knows what to expect so that the employees don't feel like you're withholding information from them, but instead protecting people and protecting their rights while still keeping everyone's safety in mind. Yeah, if I could just pick up on that for a second, Lisa, you know, I think we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're kind of conveying some sense of doom and gloom here, but I think actually employers can kind of put a positive spin on some of these things. And what I mean is when you engage with employees, you want to, just like you said, Lisa, you want to make them feel comfortable. Right. You want them to know that the company is making every effort to be compliant with all laws, to have the right kind of sick leave and accommodation and workplace safety protocols in the employee handbook. So, um, you know, I don't think a company has to take away from this seminar the fact that there's so much to worry about. I think there is a lot to worry about, but knowledge is power. And if you know right. the company knows what it's doing, I think it can really impart confidence, caring on the part of the employer as to the employees. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Jeff, what insurance coverages may provide, and I know may is the key word here, may provide coverage for COVID-19 exposures? Well, you're right. The key word is the smallest word, may. Um, <laughs> we're, we're really not sure what's going to happen, what policies are going to respond. We can only assume that there will be coverage on a couple different items. So let's run through real quick some of the policies that you may expect to receive some coverages. The workers' comp policy, uh, depending upon the state in which you preside, uh, each one of them are passing laws. It's very difficult to determine where you contracted COVID-19, um, but I think that the first responders and the healthcare workers absolutely will have the opportunity to collect on their workers' compensation policies. The next would be the employment practices, and Michael did speak to that, where he's seeing much more litigation for people um, on the employment practices side. We're seeing a significant increase in that line of coverage. You're having people that feel that they were discriminated against because they weren't able to provide the protocols that they felt safe with, therefore they didn't come to work, they got laid off, they bring in claims and unfortunately the claim settlements are going through the roof right now. Uh, one of the other items that's not listed on the list, but I think it's important to bring out is a cyber policy. 
what's happening is a lot of the the carrier the, the, the companies are being hacked these days people have a lot of time on their hands they're getting sophisticated some people are not in the office to the extent that they were before some of their it has been a little bit reduced so what's happening is you're having these bad actors come in they get onto their website they'll send a phishing expedition somebody will click on it and then what they do is hold you ransom they hold the server ransom you have to pay in bitcoins it becomes quite the process uh, moving on, uh, general liability policies. Again, if there's no COVID exclusion. So those that were written prior to the pandemic probably have some form of coverage, but those moving after at this point in time are definitely having some form of a COVID related exclusion added to it. Next would be some of the event policies. Uh, think about having a uh, golf outing having a wedding, you can ensure, believe it or not, you can ensure the weather. And what's happening is some of those policies may provide some coverage. Most people don't have them unless there's a specific event that they are providing. The directors and officers liability, it's getting hit very hard. Most of the, a lot of companies are not meeting their earnings. A lot of them are closing. A lot of them are not keeping the contracts in place with their vendors. And the litigation, I'm sure Michael will tell you, is going through the roof. Yeah. Um, on the property side, I know I'll, I would assume that many uh, people on the line thought that there was coverage when they had uh, COVID-19 come to play and had to shut down your facilities, let your people go home. Unfortunately, the business interruption is triggered by two words, direct and physical. And it's really not been a direct or physical loss. However, there are some companies that are out there, uh, FM Global, for example, that does have and does provide a sublimit for communicable diseases. And there may be an opportunity to obtain some coverage on that line. Staying with the property, there's also a civil authority uh, provision in many cases, uh, providing access, ingress and egress to your facility as provided by a civil authority, not letting you in or out. And you may find that there is some coverage available on that venue. Next would be pollution. Uh, there are some pollution policies, believe it or not, that do pick up some of the airborne contaminants and may provide some coverage for that. Uh, some of the clients or people that are on the line may have uh, international exposures and have a travel accident policy in place and would have to bring their employees back that would also go on a worker's comp or general liability policy for repatriation and endemic disease to bring them back and get them home and get them safe. Uh, there are potential coverages that will be coming out to address the pandemic. Uh, I've seen them starting. Their price point is starting at a minimum of $250,000. I've not seen any policies put in place. I'd be hesitant to purchase them at this point in time because there is no traction on whether or not they actually will provide coverage, but it will be interesting. I think that we will see something similar to what we saw with 9-11 and the terrorism, where the government may backstop a product and provide some coverage for the policyholder. Um, it'll be interesting. Currently, there are several cases that are under litigation right now that are testing the policies and as those tests come, come out, there may find that there are some areas that can be covered. What I find very interesting is that the majority of the uh, claims have not been sent to public adjusters. Public adjusters, they file claims on behalf of insureds for property losses stemming from fires and uh, other, cla other claims that are covered under the policies nobody's touched it because they don't really see where coverage will apply. So we're going to have to watch the court system, see how this litigation plays out and potentially find a sliver of coverage that will provide a return for many of the dollars that have been lost. So for right now, it looks like it's, or I should say, it sounds like a lot of watching and waiting. Yeah, it's, it's yet to be determined. And uh, 
I think that as time moves forward, they will address it, but it currently is not contemplated in the premium or in the coverages that are available today. Thank you. Okay, Michael, should employers have employees sign a COVID waiver? Maybe just a little explanation of what a COVID waiver is might be helpful. And if you would share some of the pros and cons around having employers have employees sign a COVID waiver. And if so, what is the frequency that the new waiver you know, would need to be signed? Sure, thanks. Um, a COVID waiver involves a, uh, a, rec a, a written document where a questionnaire is presented um, to the signer of the document about their health. They disclose what their medical condition is in terms of the virus. And it would um, hold the employer harmless from any claims should that employee uh, or visitor contract the virus and allege that the reason he or she contracted it was because they were at that particular place of business. So I, I'd like to expand the question a little bit because I think employers really have two categories of personnel, so to speak, um, that would be impacted by a COVID waiver. The first is employees, and the second are visitors or guests to the employer's place of business. So let's start with the employees. Um, I think the cons, so to speak, of having employees sign a COVID waiver far outweigh the pros. Um, we start with federal law. Employers under federal law cannot enforce liability or safety waivers against their employees. It's just not permitted under federal law. It's considered a violation of public policy to force an employee to waive their rights under a state's compensation laws. So um, it's not going to be enforceable under federal law. It may be enforceable under state law. The reason I'm not a fan of them is because I think it's a pathway to create tension between the employer and the employee, which I think everyone would want to uh, avoid. Um, if an employer rep uh, presents rather the COVID waiver to the employee, I think many employees first thought is, what is my employer worried about? Should I be concerned that he or she isn't following the proper safety protocols that they want to write their way out of getting sued if I contract the virus? Now, it's really up to the particular employer if the employer says, yeah, I don't care about that employee tension. I want to be protected. And if under your state law, it can be enforceable, then that would be a business decision made by the employer. But for that reason, uh, the employee tension and the unenforceability of the waivers under federal law, I generally um, caution my clients against asking their employees to sign these waivers. Visitors or guests though are another, um, another subject. And I strongly encourage the employer to have a form drafted where a visitor, when he or she comes to the place of business, answers the questionnaire setting forth if the employee, withdraw that, whether the visitor has had um, any symptoms, 
been in contact with anyone who's had symptoms, has traveled to a quarantine state, those kinds of things, um, because A, the employer wants to know those kinds of things, and B, if the employees know that's going on, it raises the confidence level on the part of the employee as to how safety conscious the employer is. So um, I think the, the takeaway I'd suggest is, Lisa, to this particular question is, I would discourage, not strongly discourage, but discourage asking employees to sign a COVID waiver. We have not done that at my law firm. And as I said, between staff and lawyers, we have 95 uh, we have 95 lawyers. We have about 130 total people working for the law firm. We haven't asked them to sign a COVID waiver, um, but as to visitors and guests, uh, that COVID waiver uh, should be presented to and signed by those visitors and guests. Yeah, I hear you. And we both know the last thing we need is more tension in the workplace as it is um, employees are dealing with a lot of tension every day and the, right. uh, you know, balance between their work and their home and the fact that those have become so merged so closely together because of circumstances that are out of everyone's control, quite um, frankly. Uh, to expand on one of your answers a little bit, so if I have a log at, a, at my uh, place of work and we are keeping track of uh, uh, through a COVID waiver of our visitors. If that visitor, if we, if we end up with a case of COVID in our office, what, are we then required to notify our visitors that there's been a COVID case in our office? I think it goes back to what we discussed a few minutes ago, kind of in connection with privacy. If that visitor um, has been in contact with someone at the company, uh, I think that visitor should be advised that he or she was in contact with someone um, who tested positive for the virus. Again, I would not disclose the identity of that employee to the visitor, but uh, um, I, I think the reasonable protocol to follow would be to try to drill down on how much contact the visitor had with that infected employee and make a reasonable judgment based on that. If they were in a conference room and the door was open and they were six feet apart, um, that would be a judgment call on the part of the employer. I would probably, if I were to fall on either side, I would fall on the side of caution and notify that visitor. But again, that's gonna be a common sense judgment on the part of the employer. Absolutely. Okay, and I'll just remind everyone, if you'll put your uh, questions either in the Q&A or in the chat, I'll be sure that when we are um, through going through our panel questions that we go and take a look at any follow-up questions or additional clarifications. And if and when we come to the end of time, we'll be sure that um, those questions are addressed, both the question and the answer in a document from, uh, with the answers from our panelists sent out to all of the participants today. I see there's questions that have come in. Uh, okay, so next, uh, how has COVID-19 affected the overall insurance market, Jeff, and what effects will that have on uh, upcoming insurance renewals for companies? Thank you, Lisa. I think we started the webinar by saying that we didn't want this to be depressing and we didn't want it to be all doom and gloom. So let's change right. that and uh, let's consider it to be challenging. Um, we have been busier than ever because our clients are in a situation right now and I think most people will agree where they can't buy insurance that's not gonna cover them for what they think that they need coverage for. They need to understand the policies. They need to understand what they have coverage for and what they're self-insuring. They certainly can't afford to overpay for the insurance that they do receive. 
And they wanna make sure that they put the protocols in place that are going to best provide them the results that they need. So let's look at a couple of things that are happening as to what is going to happen in the marketplace. We are in a hard market. And unfortunately that was happening prior to COVID-19. You take a look at the natural disasters that have occurred and right. the insurance dollars that have been spent in covering these losses have been significant. So that was already happening. What's also happened is that the insurance carriers on the auditable policies, especially, i.e. your workers' compensation, your general liability policies, are providing significant return premiums to the clients with very similar exposure because the clients are not meeting the expectations in payroll or sales that they had estimated prior to COVID-19, and the carriers are still paying the losses. Some of the other challenges that we see are when you are marketing your insurance program, that in order to set up an inspection, you can't do that physically any longer. So you need to set it up virtually. It's a challenge and it has certainly impacted the ability to obtain cost competitive quotes and look at comparisons because it's just difficult to do business. What's also happened is some of the losses that are coming in, and you go back to the slide prior as to what may or may not be covered, a lot of those coverages are paying significant losses. And what's happening is the reinsurance carriers are paying them, London is paying them. Most of the insurance companies that you have today, the Hartfords and the AIGs, they all reinsure. And what happens is they're paying more for the reinsurance than they did before. So that's an impetus to increasing of the premiums. What's also happening, which is a, a positive, is we have more people in the workforce at home. And yeah. from a worker's comp perspective, you have the ability to make amendments to the classification that you had those people in. So they would now be assigned to probably the least expensive code you have. In most cases, that would be 88. 10, which is clerical. In most states, that's about 28 cents per $100 of payroll. And there's some ability to save some money on that. Right. So reclassifying is important. Yeah, exactly. But what's most important, I believe, when your insurance policies are coming up, and this is what's kept us the busiest, is you need to conduct your marketing effort professionally. You need to get all of the underwriting information early, review it, review the losses, and then identify potential brokers and carriers that may be able to provide coverages for the exposures indigenous to your particular business and provide them with an outline, which is what we do. We create specifications for each one of our clients, outlining the coverages that we wanna see provided. As I said at the onset, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've yet to see anybody meet all of the requests that we've made, but we certainly have expanded their original offering. And now the carriers are in a situation that they may have to pay losses. Don't forget those policies are written, no offense, Michael, by attorneys that work for the insurance <laughs> company. And, oh, that's to, yeah, and their goal is to collect as much premium as they can and pay out as little as they can in, in losses. Um, it's, it's a great game. Uh, largest legalized bookie system in the world. So the idea is to put the odds in your favor and force the insurance company to identify what coverages they are providing and go through claim scenarios and meet with the underwriters and better understand what your exposures are with your claims analysis, go through what potential claims you can have how the policy is going to respond, where it's going to respond, and most importantly, if it's not going to respond. So I think that uh, an early start, making sure that uh, you really get your arms around what your exposures are, understanding your risks, and then you're in a better position to make an educated decision on the product you're going to purchase. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing that information. And we know that you are there or uh, companies like yours as a trusted resource to help um, our clients and those participating to navigate um, what's in their best interest. Okay, so 
We've covered an overview and we're gonna move into questions um, around the legal risks employers need to be most aware of related to COVID-19. Uh, we talked a bit about risk transfer and the importance of ensuring that your vendors have in place the proper coverage uh, for uh, who you're going to buy that PPE and or any safety and sterility products from for your workplace. Uh, be sure that you're not only creating and establishing the policies and protocols on returning to a safe workplace, but that you're cascading and communicating that throughout your workforce, uh, whether those employees are working from home and gradually returning to the office or that they've already returned to the office. Uh, there's a lot of insurance coverage options out there that may cover COVID-19, but as Jeff recommends, we should, should sit tight and uh, then also ensure that the coverage that uh, your company does subscribe to will indeed cover those COVID-related expenses. And this is an uh, ever-evolving process and set of circumstances, so be sure, as both of our panelists have indicated, to stay abreast of what's happening in the news as Michael said, reading the papers every day or online, whatever your preferred format is, or um, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team here at Corporate Essentials um, or to either of our panelists. You'll all be given that information as we've made it our business to understand your businesses, to allow both your employees and your clients and customers and patients be comfortable in your return to work. And with that being said, I'm going to go to the questions now, and I'm going to ask both of our um, panelists uh, uh, to, to answer accordingly. Our first question is, can employers require COVID vaccines? From an insurance perspective, there is no requirement or lack thereof. Um, I think it would be more in Michael's venue. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. That could be tested in court. Um, my inclination, uh, my, my gut would tell me that the answer would probably be no, because there are um, people who have either a religious or uh, some other reason, legitimate reason, not to want to be vaccinated. And I think if that individual can prove that he or she is following other safety protocols, I think that would be enough. But I, I assume that it's a great question and I could easily envision that, that issue uh, being litigated in a court. Right, and as you said, I know that there are other exemptions for all the other vaccines out there. So. Right. I'm sure that's a, a big answer and a big process as we'll all see going forward in the future. Thank you. Our next question, are companies legally required to conduct contract tracing to limit further exposures? For example, tracking the building occupants and who they came into contact with on a given day. Well, I, can, I can perhaps at least start uh, answering that. Uh, again, you have to consult. I don't know where everybody is headquartered on this call, but at least for New York and New Jersey, I'm not aware of any legal obligation to conduct contact tracing to limit further exposures. Um, everyone should consult their own state's laws. Um, I'm not aware of any state mandating that as a matter of law, but at least in the New, New, New York and New Jersey, it's not required. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our next question, does the practice of conducting contract tracing relate to general liability insurance coverage? Does the practice of contract, of conducting con contract tracing relate to your general liability insurance coverage? Um, I don't see where there would be a correlation between the two. Um, the general liability policy is one that's in place for bodily injury or property damage. 
uh, with claims that are brought against by a third party, I think that uh, you may look more towards the employment practices liability policy if there was an invasion of privacy or people did not want uh, to be notified or have their information out that they uh, did contract COVID-19. So I think it would probably fall more into that venue than it would into a general liability exposure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And our next question, would you please explain how the risk transfers can be put into place with a vendor for the PPE kit? So uh, a, a vendor that is providing the personal protect, protection equipment, masks, gloves, all that. Yeah, sure. Um, what, what happens is you should be having contracts with anybody that you are working with, uh, either a contractor doing work on your behalf to build the building, make modifications, and or to vendors that you're receiving supplies from. And in that contract, what it will do is it will identify what the relationship is, as well as what requirements you are putting upon your vendor. So in this particular case, what you want to do is you want to have the vendor confirm that they are going to hold you harmless and indemnify you for any product that they provide to you because if they're providing a product, uh, whether it's PPE or otherwise, where somebody gets injured and they want to come back and sue, you'd rather them sue <laughs> the vendor than sue you. Their, their sole recourse is workers' comp for you as the employer, but then you would want to be reimbursed by the vendor who provided the product that, that failed. So you have the contract in place, it identifies what insurance coverages you want them to provide. And what you then require is a certificate of insurance that's going to identify and capture all of the coverages that you required in your contract. And the most important part of that certificate of insurance is adding you as an additional insured. So that way what happens is the vendor's policy would respond in place of yours. So again, back to just making sure that your vendor has that proper coverage from the beginning before yeah. you begin procuring the that's PPE. Good. Yep, and that's one of the items that candidly gets overlooked more times than not. And it's usually the smallest of providers that causes the largest losses. And I will ensure all of you participating today, many of you know us, some of you don't, Corporate Essentials does have all the applicable coverages that are required to provide to you um, everything that we do today and everything Absolutely. that we have put in place to adapt ourselves to help you in having your employees return safely to the workplace. I do see a raised hand from Nancy Pfeffer. Nancy, is there a question that you have that you're unable to put in the, uh, in the chat? I've unmuted you if for some reason you need to speak it versus type it. Okay, so I didn't hear. I, yeah, I didn't either. And I see oh. no additional questions or comments in the chat. So um, moving along, I want to thank Jeff for participating today as our ex uh, expert on uh, insurance and risk, as well as Michael and all of you will have this additional contact information. In follow-up to today, again, I'm Lisa DeMar with Corporate Essentials hosting this on our behalf. I, uh, all of you will receive in follow-up an email with uh, the information from today's webinar, as well as a form to provide us with your address to uh, provide our gift of gratitude. We are happy to see that so many of you are interested in the content that we are providing, and we're sure that you have found this valuable. Look forward to our next session on returning employees safely to the workplace. We'll be sure to let all of you know about it. And if in the meantime, 
don't hesitate to contact me. Here's my contact information. I'm happy to put you in touch with someone on my team or one of our subject matter experts from today. And if it's not in the area of insurance or legal, don't hesitate to ask us. If we don't provide it, we can definitely point you in the right direction. So we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar and we thank you for your participation today. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Michael. Thank you. And I will Thanks, speak. Lisa. You're very welcome. I'll speak to both of you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for participating. Thanks.